Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Welcome everyone and happy Earth Month. Uh, my name is Jorge Mena, Associate Director of the Rafael Cintron Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, known as the LCC. Um, thank you for joining us in the Zona Abierta online program and many thanks to our co-sponsors, both the Office of Diversity, Equity and Engagement and the Department of Biological Sciences. Zona Abierta is a Latino Cultural Center program series which highlights the intersection of arts, humanities, science, culture, and civic life with presentations by local, national, and international artists, scholars, and community leaders. Today's program is the third, the final installment of three presentations that the LCC is hosting this semester for a series we've titled Radical Research from BIPOC Scholars at UIC, which is in collaboration with scholars who are part of the Bridge to Faculty program at UIC. For those of you who may be unaware, the Bridge to Faculty program is a recruitment initiative within the Office of Diversity, specifically designed to attract underrepresented postdoctoral scholars with the goal of a direct transition to a tenure track junior faculty position. This series is the second installment as we hosted four different scholars in the spring of 2022. You can view um, all of these pr previous presentations on our LCC YouTube, which we will share in the chat. Um, now, I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Ignacio Escalante Mesa. Um, Dr. Ignacio Escalante Mesa is a tropical biologist that studies the mechanisms of animal behavior. He obtained his PhD in environmental science, policy and management from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a master's and a bachelor's of science in biology from the Universidad de Costa Rica. Before joining, uh, joining us here at UIC in the Department of Biological Sciences, Dr. Escalante Mesa was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. In today's presentation, um, Dr. Ignacio Escalante Mesa will discuss in part his previous research on the behavioral ecology of daddy long legs from Costa Rica, as well as other ongoing projects to study these arachnids in Chicago and surrounding areas. His research integrates questions and approaches from animal behavior, ecology, communication, biomechanics, and physiology to explore how and why animals perform behaviors that we observe. To read more about Dr. Ignacio Escalante Mesa and his work, please visit the link that we'll also share in the chat. The presentation today will be about 35 to 40 minutes and will be followed by a short conversation facilitated by our program coordinator, Justin Munguia Chavez. We invite you along the presentation to place comments and questions in the chat. Um, that way, Justin can direct these to our speaker later on in the program. All righty, that's my introduction. Welcome, bienvenido, Ignacio. Gracias. Um, okay, so it sounds like the presentation is there. I'm sharing your CMI slides. Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all for being here. I wanna um, thank Jorge, Jocelyn, Lauren, and the Rafael Cintron uh, Cultural Center for hosting me and for actually running these fantastic series of, of lectures and activities. And it's just uh, amazing to see such a robust uh, cultural center being in the forefront and leading these, uh, their work uh, nationwide. And, and before joining UIC, I was aware of, of the amazing work that the LCC was doing. So it's very exciting to be here now, being on, on this side of, um, of the program and supporting the program. So I'm very excited. I have been at UIC for um, almost one academic year. So I started here in, in, in August. And I'm, yeah, as, as Jorge mentioned, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my previous work, some of things that are ongoing and like so sort of hinting the, the type of projects that my research group, that I expect my research group to be uh, engaging in the next couple of years. So I'm going to tell you the, the fancy title, you're seeing it there, the mechanisms and evolutionary implications of behavior. But in reality, I'm going to tell you a story about what animals do, what they do, and a very particular group of animals so I like to think myself as the ambassador of these arachnids too I'm just, just always happy to tell the story of these animals um, in any capacity at some point today I'm going to give you uh, I want to give you a heads up at some point I'm going to ask for some participation 
um very quickly very uh sh short participation but I'll, I'll i just wanted to give you a heads up now um okay so i'm going to show you a video no sound but here's a video of animals doing something <laughs> and this sort of like describes what i do most of the time or at least most of the time i, I intend to do be doing this observing animals doing things in the wild, in lab condition, but understanding and taking a look at what they're doing to understand sort of like what are the implications in, uh, in terms of evolutionary biology and in ecology, as well as where does behavior come from. So what you saw there, I'm going to give you more information now. <laughs> it's a pair of uh, opiliones or daddy long legs or harvestmen. I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably throughout the talk interacting in the context of reproduction. But I wanted to use this as an example just to tell you sort of like what I do. And I'm, my research is focused around animal behavior in understanding sort of like the what and the how to understand sort of the mechanisms of what are animals doing, what are the physiological, mechanical, um, and communication mechanisms that animals are doing to sort of like interact with each other and with their environment. As well as we want to understand sort of like why animals do what they do, what are the fitness or like evolutionary implications of, of these behaviors, as well as where these are these behaviors coming from. So to understand like the evolutionary biology of or using tools in evolutionary biology to understand why we see what we see today. So and, you know, we use this framework that, that was developed in, in the mid um, 1900s to sort of understand any type of behavior. So why dogs bark, uh, why humans are interested in consuming um, uh, fermented substances, those have like a sort of like an evolutionary component. And we sort of like use tools as the ones that I'm gonna show you today to sort of understand what are those implications and how we got to this point. And my research overall sort of like tries to understand beha animal behavior in, an, in the environmental context that is relevant for a given animal. So what out there in the field their animals are experiencing, whether it's like natural or human induced change or just the natural cycles of uh, abiotic climatic conditions and so on, as well as, inter as well as interaction with other animals, what are those sources causing what we see? One of the things that is a very prevalent source of, of, of pressure for animals are other animals. And what you see here uh, are one spider, one jumping spider eating another spider. And as, as I already mentioned, I study mostly or part of my research involved tropical species and predation is one of the main pressure that shapes behavior. So animals have been subjected to potential predators, potential parasites, and so on, oh, diseases and so on. And that has certainly modulated what we see today in the animals in particular behaviors that we explore. So this is a story about how animals have been um, found ways to deal with predation pressure. And it's a story about one of those solutions. So one of the solutions that animals have evolved to sort of like deal with morphological damage coming from uh, potential predators is evolving the capacity of losing parts of their body. So you see in the top left, uh, lizard that lost part of their tail in the, in the middle and in the top, there's um, a sister that has lost part of the one of, that has lost part of one arm. <laughs> and throughout the slide, you see other pictures of animals that have evolved the capacity to lose legs, uh, wings. Even in the bottom left, you see scorpions. Scorpions have recently been discovered to uh, shed part of their tail uh, to escape potential encounters with predators. So it's a very sort of like common tactic amongst animals, and it's a behavior that we refer to as autotomy. Is when an animal voluntarily has the ability to lose part of their body to sort of like escape, survive, and escape uh, encounters with predators. You see a picture here from a recent paper in which, well, this is a strategy that one of the reptiles involved in this interaction aim to do to sort of like escape from this predation pressure. So a couple of years ago, we did a review of this autotomy uh, phenomenon across the animal kingdom. And what you're seeing here 
is uh, we call it like a phylogeny and evolutionary tree. Don't worry about the names. What's important, that the important part that I want to highlight here is that we explore across all animals, all animal phyla um, throughout the animal kingdom, how common this strategy is and how many times animals have evolved the ability to release parts of their body voluntarily. Long story short, up to seven, some at some point between seven or nine different times, animals have evolved the ability to voluntarily lose parts of their body to escape this predation. Saying, uh, suggesting that this is a fairly common strategy across the animal kingdom. And what I'm interested in is what I'm interested in is understanding what are the potential consequences and when does um, an, uh, a defensive strategy that looks so extreme as losing a leg or part of your body or tail becomes evolutionary uh, beneficial and how animals can deal with that in the long term. To do this, I study uh, opiliones, which is one order of arachnids. So uh, if you're not super uh, familiar or fond of spiders, well, the good news here is that these animals are not spiders, even though they're still arachnids. So they are a different group of arachnids, different order. And what you see here is one of them. Um, the, main re the main difference is that they have only one body segment. So they just look like, and you're gonna see, you saw a video already, basically they're just like an m, &M with very long, thin legs. So what you see here is one of one animal uh, from Southeast Asia actually eating uh, fruit. So these animals are omnivorous and they can eat whatever they find in the field, which is very interesting and very unique. They can eat living prey, they can scavenge for dead prey, they can eat um, also, they can eat fungi, nectar, sugar, etc. So they are very important part of the ecosystems in that respect. Around Halloween time, this type of story are always popping up in the media. And this is from the New Yorker or New York Times a few years ago, um, in which they show, they highlight the New York Times. Yeah, sorry. Uh, they highlight how common they are and they, they can be a creation, which is another part of the story that I will tell you uh, in a second. So these are prevailing animals, and I'm now I'm going to show you a video that we developed in collaboration with KQED, the PVS station in Northern California. And well, maybe not super surprisingly, these animals have the ability to lose parts of their legs. So this basically how they are walking around in their lives. And when they feel certain pressure in particular joints, in particular parts of their legs, they could immediately create a plate like here, here like in their shoulder and immediately release by muscle contraction, release that leg and escape. And what you see here now is the leg twitching that eventually allows animals to run away because they're distracting the potential um, predator so they can survive. You might be wondering at this point who might be interested in or what kind of animal would be interested in eating um, opiliones. Turns out there's a very wide diversity of animals that have been reported eating these animals out there, so ranging from birds, frogs, lizards, all the whole range of, of, of uh, arthropods, spiders, even other opiliones, centipedes, and so on. They so they. What we, what we infer is that they are facing a very intense predator pressure, and particularly in tropical environments, animals are very subjected to this, uh, to this pressure. So why studying opiliones? Um, besides the fact that they're, they're amazing, but if, to put it in a more objective perspective, I'm going to tell you a few like cocktail facts about them and why I uh, decided to study them for most of my graduate work. So leg loss is super common in this group. You're going to see now a graph in which I'm showing you the percentage of animals that we found in the field missing zero, one, two, or three legs. And the issue is that, and that dashed line is the 50%. So more than half of animals in a given population, this is a population in Costa Rica that I'll show you pictures soon, um, more than half of those animals are missing at least one leg, suggesting how common and prevalent this strategy is. 
Additionally, second uh, cocktail fact, they do not regenerate their legs. So even though they lose them early on, they do not have the ability to regenerate them. Or we, now we're starting to think that they are not interested in, in, in regenerating for, for reasons that I'll show you later. But this suggests that the fact that whatever consequences they are facing, those consequences will be long term because they cannot regain that leg or legs that they lost. And the third fun fact is that they have two types of legs. They have locomotor legs and they have that sensory leg, which is the second pair of legs. So that picture that you see on the right is imagine seeing a, uh, an opilion from the top. So they will, it will be moving towards the right. Um, the second pair of legs is secondarily modified. Then it has, uh, it's elongated and has a very high um percentage of sensory structures and they use them as antenna to sort of like sense the environment around. So with all of this in mind, I was interested in understanding for my PhD uh, research to understand what are the potential costs of autonomy for this group of animals. And here I want to highlight the uh, crucial part that my dissertation committee play in, in this work. So everything that I did was possible thanks to the mentorship of fantastic people, mostly Damian Elias, my PhD advisor, Rosie Gillespie, and Eileen Lacey back at the University of California, Berkeley. I also want to highlight that three people were fundamental in, in helping me achieve this work. Mark Badger, a graduate student uh, at the time at Berkeley, Veronica Ellis, who was an undergrad working in the lab at the time, and she is currently uh, finishing her Teach for America program here in Chicago. Um, and Leticia Clasen Rodriguez was a collaborator, undergrad student from the University of Puerto Rico at the moment, who helped me design and conduct some of the work that you might see today. So main main axis of the of the talk is the cost of autonomy and in four acts so the interesting thing with this system and going back to my original point is that i was able to study different mechanisms i was able to study their movement as well as their physiological consequences of leg loss and this sort of like helps me understand behavior from a mechanistic side and additionally i study uh, the influence of leg loss in ecology and survival, as well as in reproduction to understand the fitness or the evolutionary consequences of this type of behavior. I did most of this work in uh, Costa Rica, where I am from, where that song that you listen to uh, at the beginning is. So it's just funny, parenthesis, but it's just funny to hear that song every day for 28 years and not and, and don't listen to it for eight years after that and now listen it back. So I really appreciate hearing that today. But uh, this is Costa Rica. So most of my work I conducted at a few field stations, one in nord Northeastern Costa Rica, which is called La Selva Biological Station. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of how working and living on a field station for a certain period of time is. So it's very unique, a very unique situation. And this is one of the sites that has in which scientists since the 1950s have undergone um, and have dived deep in understanding tropical forests. And most of our uh, knowledge from tropical forests come from a few of these sites, mostly in Latin America, to understand what is the, the ecological dynamics in, in these systems. So you see pictures in the bottom of people doing actual field, field research there. My other study site is Las Cruces Biological Station in southwestern Costa Rica. It's a little different in terms of the environment that we see there, but um, kind of sort of like looked like this. And some of my work also has involved um, in interacting in the communities there. And I'll be happy to chat more about this. Uh, it's a very unique part of the country in the Coto, Coto Bruce Valley down there. There's an interesting uh, demographic and socio his, uh, historical component in what doing research there means. But going back to leg loss, the first story I'm gonna tell you is about how do I study this? How do I study locomotion? So I wanted to understand what happens when they lose legs in terms of their velocity, in terms of how, in terms of how they walk, how they move. So I went to the field, collected a bunch of animals, uh, kept them alive in individual containers for a, for a one week. And after that period, we released them back out there. And what you see here is a sort of like very um, 
Latin American way <laughs> to studying their biomechanics, their locomotion. You see on the left, a GoPro camera and a mirror placed at the bottom in 45 degrees, which is the cheapest way in which we can have a video as you're going to see here on the right of the animal. So sort of like tracing the trajectory of the animal frame by frame and eventually with a lot of sort of like computers, computing skills in MATLAB, Mathematic and a few other software tools, um, we were able to sort of like trace the trajectory in X, Y, Z points of these animals to understand and sort of and be able to quantify their velocity. So, uh, okay, so the first thing we did, we, we did a bunch of these recordings and the first thing I found out was that was a side project. That was one, one of those very cool moments in which you try to do something and then you find something else is that they have a very interesting diversity of moving gates. They could be doing their the normal running that you see out there. They could be doing something like bouncy that we call studying um, and, and sort of like galloping sort of uh, behavior. They could do, be doing something like bobbing that, as you saw in the previous video, in which they are alternating and sort of like doing this bouncy movement up and down repeatedly. Or they could be doing sort of like more the walking standard slower with not sort of like moving their body from the ground. So to understand this, we sort of like quantify their, their trajectories and we describe uh, with a bunch of biomechanics tools sort of like how these gates are different. And we discover a new sort of like dimension of how behavior can be different in these animals by using different type of movement. So what you see here is those four same four videos that I showed you earlier and the trajectory of each of those animals. And so we still do not know what are the what's the ecological importance of this of this behavior. So of this type of behavior. So that's very interesting thing. So again, I'm showing you the video of, of that you saw early, and in the top you see the trajectory that the animal does across the XYZ uh, coordinates. So after after that sort of like. Uh, let me let me move one slide. After that, then we were able to ask the question: Is is autonomy affecting their locomotion, their kinematics? And we explored uh, different animals in which we experimentally induced them to lose legs in different capacity. I'm showing here uh, animals that lost zero, one, two, or three legs in different combinations. And what you're going to see here on the y-axis is the average horizontal velocity. In the x-axis is relative to leg loss, so if how fast they were moving before, immediately after, and after a few hours of losing legs. What we found is that those animals that, unsurprisingly, those animals that lost two or more legs found uh, experience a decrease in their velocity. But what was interesting is when we follow the same animals over time, we saw an increase. Uh, animals were able to sort of like recover their initial velocity, and we still do not fully understand how they do it, but they change their posture. They use sort of, sort of like biomechanics, kinematic tools uh, or strategies to change the way they walk in order to regain initial speed. And why is that important for animals? Well, we think that that's important because they, that allows them to sort of like move at, a, at, a, at, a, at the velocity in which they will be more successful to run away. You're going to see here a video of the same animal with eight, then with six and then with eight legs again moving after recovery. So they were able to use their their behavior and their kinematics to sort of like go from this stage in which their velocity is very impaired to sort of like recover that initial uh, velocity in this, in this case. So they can have a very interesting uh, behavioral plasticity. And they now that we explore sort of like more detailed kinematics of what they're doing, we're sort of like discovering this part. Okay, so at this point, in the interest of time, I'm gonna show you one of these three uh, chapters. So this is the moment where I want to see if um, you can tell me which of these three topics you do you want to hear. So number one, the effect of leg loss on physiology, number two, the effect on ecology and survival, or number three, the reproduction. Uh, and maybe you can put it on the chat or on yourself and tell me, um, yeah, okay, I'm able to see the chat now. Okay. 
great. I see a lot of twos, so I'm gonna go with number two in 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 this case. Thank you for participating. This is the first time I try this, but um, I'm excited that somehow it it somehow worked. Okay, so. I've told you about uh, how they're able to use their behavior to to how their behavior and their mechanics is affected, and and that's a, a mechanistic approach to understanding animal behavior. And in this case, um, part of the project was also trying to understand what happens in the long term. So what I did here is explore the effect of habit of autonomy on habitat use and long term survival to see what are the evolutionary cues. Or or um, imp or implication that the behavior can can pose in these animals. the The interesting thing is that they are using their legs for different things, right? And I mentioned they use them, they use their legs. Uh, Opidiones use their legs to sense the environment. So all of their sensory input comes from their legs. So you would think that whatever ways they are using to navigate the environment will be affected by losing legs. So these three processes, finding food, selecting microhabitats, and surviving could also be affected by autonomy. And how this can look, so it could be the difference between using sort of like branches at the main place to, to hide, to now start using different types of substrate or leaf litter, or moving away, changing how they use the environment, as well as changing the, the probability of surviving. So for this, I study this um, in Las Cruces in southwestern Costa Rica. And but the first thing that I did was sort of like um, serving where they are. And mostly I found out after serving a few hundred uh, animals is that they're mostly found in three different habitats, either mossy trees or tree bark that doesn't have any moss or fern stems, fern stems in which they can even congregate. So what I then did was quantified which of them in those three different habitats were missing legs or were they intact. So in blue, you're going to see intact. And in orange and on the right, you're going to see animals missing any combination of legs. And on the y-axis, you're going to see the abundance of those animals. So when you survey animals that are intact, uh, this is sort of the pattern that you see. And when we explored what happens when they are missing legs is sort of the same uh, in the same proportion. So animals are using the same habitats in the same way uh, when we go out and find them. But then I wanted to see if there could be a recovery component. As I told you earlier, um, there could be a recovery component. And if I wanted to see if over time they were able to change the, the substrate and if they were able to change their how they use their habitat um, once they lose legs. So what I did is I, I, I did a field experiment in which I induced them to lose legs, two legs in this case, and I put them back in the environment. And then I did a, what we call in ecology a mark a recapture study. You just go there every day and look for them in the same site. How do you mark? And this might be the question you have right now. How do you mark these daddy long legs? Well, with a lot of nail polish and, and white out. So for, for a whole summer, I was out there in the tropical pre-montane forest of Costa Rica, painting, um, painting using nail polish to mark these animals, which is non-toxic. We did some trials to confirm that they, that the, yeah, that these do not affect their behavior or their survival. And then looking for them across time. And what you see here on the bottom right is an animal that on the back has a pink and white mark. So it was super exciting. It's one of those things that we in animal behavior do that are like pretty, pretty weird, but very exciting is just going out there in the field and getting super excited that you found an animal that is marked. <laughs> so over time, um, what we found was long story short that there was no difference in how the animals were using the environment before or after they lost legs experimentally, which suggests that then habitat use is not being affected by this defensive strategy. Additionally, the recapture rates were super similar, were uh, statistically non-different between these, these groups. It was around 20%, suggesting overall that there are no fitness implications uh, of this defensive strategy as animals as opiliones 
um, seem unaffected in their survival. So we were able to recapture them in the same proportion, suggesting that losing legs in this, in this case had no direct influence in their survival, or at least no indirect influence on their survival, suggesting then, giving us sort of like evolutionary clues of why this strategy is so prevalent in these in these systems and how they're able to sort of like deal with this morphological damage. Um, okay, so in summary, sort of like what I found out in, in, in this research in trying to understand the effects of an anti-predator strategy across many different sort of like behaviors and many components of what these animals do. First of all, in movement, I show you they there are short-term consequences from which they can recover. Um, I didn't tell you due to, due to the vote, I didn't tell you about the physiology, but what we did here is understanding, um, explore their their energetics of, of movement. So their oxygen consumption, so physiologically moving with less number of legs is energetically more costly. We don't know if they can recover and we did not test this, but we found out that they were, uh, there are sort of some um, short-term consequences of that. So from the mechanism perspective, the short-term implications of this defensive strategy of losing legs, it's, uh, seems detrimental, but the interesting component and then sort of like the most novel part of this is finding that these animals have the ability to compensate and use sort of like plant bees to deal with this morphological damage. In terms of ecology and survival, I show you that there are no costs um, in, in this case for, for how animals are using the environment and surviving in, in, in the field. And lastly, their production part show the same pattern. Animals that have lost legs, whether are the females or the males, were as likely to uh, access mating, suggesting no uh, long-term consequences in the reproduction for this sort of like extreme defensive strategy. So this suggests on the fitness or, or evolutionary implications of this behavior showing no cause of, of, of this behavior. So overall, this, this finding got us to sort of like rethink like, you know, what were the initial expectations that we have, how we come up with these hypotheses uh, in the first place. And um, these animals seem to be super robust to what the potential pred predation pressure is. And we're thinking that this sort of like allows us to think that animals sort of like more holistically have the ability to be robust, to withstand the potential consequences of morphological damage in an ecological perspective. Um, and they have potentially also have evolved the, the ability of having compensatory mechanisms that might have evolved coupled uh, or in tandem with these sort of like extreme behaviors. So this is a way of saying that, you know, in parallel to having defensive strategy that could be initially so detrimental to what these animals are doing, um, they seem to be doing fine. This is sort of like one of the main um, surprising findings of my research at this point. Um, future work on, on this could also, I'm interested in exploring sort of like the neural mechanisms, what happens at the brain and like the, and, and the neural, neuronal level in these animals. And we want to understand also sort of like how this plays a role in a broader ecological uh, perspective, particularly also in the context of um, human induced change. If we as, as, as humans and our activities are putting sort of like, uh, um, changes in biodiversity in the that could have eventually lead to changes in the uh, predation pressure and all other ecological pressure that animals are experiencing. So how are animals responding with potentially these or other behavioral strategies to these changes in their environment? And that's one of the sort of like directions that I expect my research program to move in the next couple of years, particularly here with local species in Chicago. Great. Um, the last part of this talk, I want to mention a little bit briefly of, oh, okay, no, implications. And then the last part is going to be um, hints of, of another ongoing project. But to, to put this in perspective, why are we interested in exploring animal behavior? Why leg loss? Why uh, biomechanics? Well, in a way, 
uh, we want to understand sort of like the evolutionary trajectory of, of the behaviors and other traits that we see in animals. You see here another sort of like phylogenetic tree of different groups of arachnids. So by approaching this, this work, we want to understand how animals have evolved defensive behaviors, not only how they have evolved its morphology or color and so on, but how behavior can play a role and how we can sort of like understand throughout the evolutionary history of animals the way they have de they have dealt with um, with the pressures from the environment, and also how they have evolved compensatory mechanisms. And this, and this is sort of like a very new perspective on understanding animal movement and animal behavior in how they have evolved sort of plan Bs to deal with potential damage through that. Another. Um, dimension that this research has implications is understanding the ecology and conservation of these not only these these species but also these environments most of my work as i mentioned happen happens in the tropics and i want to move to to understand these systems in in um here in north america so we also want to understand by by Undergoing this research, we want to understand how animals deal with environmental pressure. And I, I, I mentioned briefly, but how environmental pressure change, how those change in the biodiversity can affect the behavior and other sort of like traits that we see out there in the field. One dimension that I want my research to move into is understanding these in an urban ecology and conservation setting here in, in the Chicago and, and Cook County area and beyond there are at least five different species of, of um, opiliones in the genus Liobunum. There's another species that is an invasive species that came from Europe. And what you see here on the right is iNaturalist records of, of these animals, of these different species. So there, there's more to be done in, in future research in my group aims to uh, explore how this behavior in biomechanics is playing a role in this context. Also, applications of this research. This is something that uh, while developing this work came um, in, in some of this work understand had some of these understanding these topics has implications for, for example, biomedical research. So understanding how animals deal with morphological damage with limb loss has the ability to inform prosthetic and bio-inspired device, as well as fabrics and technology. Uh, what you see here in the bottom right is it's um, a paper that developed very interesting fabric based on uh, how the way the vertebra of lizards work when they lose their tail, which is super interesting. Um, and also to understand robotics, how rescue robots, for example, are able to deal with morphological damage. If we understand how animals deal with injury, we can understand sort of like how robots can do this. And there's uh, engineers are super interested in this. The Department of, of, of Energy is and Department of Defense are sort of like interested in this. So coming from like an, a tropical ecology and animal behavior perspective is super interesting and super surprising when I get to interact with people in engineering fields, in robotics that are telling me they are interested in understanding this work. And then my research gets cited in robotics paper, which is like something that I never thought would happen uh, when I started doing this work. But it's interesting to see these findings put in a different perspective and sort of like understand how this basic uh, fundamental research that we do has uh, real-time, um, real-world applications. The last thing that I'll mention is uh, currently my research sort of involves understanding animal aggregations and how they communicate and how they're able to deal with uh, with variation in how they're using chemical signals. So you're going to see here a video of a bunch of daddy long legs <laughs> in Costa Rica and moving in real-time and then eventually goes to slow motion. So this is slowed uh, four times and they have the ability to do these super interesting behaviors that we super do not understand. And every time I present this video, people ask me, why do they do it? I do not know yet. <laughs> so I'm embarrassed that I don't have an answer right now, but ongoing research, I expect to give us some clue of why are they using this sort of like aggregation behavior and this communication to sort of like uh, defend themselves, transmit information we super do not know. 
Another component of, of, of aggregation is they can form aggregation with other species. So imagine these animals, these, these arachnids, sharing the same place with other animals from all the species. And this is very interesting because different species have different uh, communication signals. They have different morphology. They have different size. They have different parasites, different uh, food requirements, and so on. So we want to understand how animals can overcome all these obstacles and still form these aggregations. In this video, you're gonna see um, animals of different species aggregating together. And this is also in Costa Rica. What you see here, hopefully, is little animals of different color and they correspond to different um, species. So this is just a one of those mossy branches I was telling you earlier and up to 40 different animals of so five different species are, are, are roosting or spending the day uh, together, we do not understand why. So one of the main uh, research questions that is going to give me a lot to do and read and give my um, my research lab members a lot to do in the next couple of years is understanding why and how these opilionists form these aggregations with other species. We have some preliminary data, we have some work out there, um, but we still don't fully do not fully understand why they do this, and this is sort of like one of the puzzling, exciting new areas that I am to explore. I want to acknowledge, in addition to my uh, to colleagues in, in dissertation committee, um, I want to acknowledge the work of um, a fantastic group of undergraduate researchers from the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee that helped me develop all this work and with whom this research will not be impossible. I also want to acknowledge people at the field station, uh, res resident biologists, GI GIS technicians, um, the general staff, uh, people that sort of like help me uh, help this project, um, help this research come, come together. And of course, I want to thank a lot of uh, funding agency, the Organization of Tropical Studies based in Costa Rica, Smithsonian Institute, the Fulbright, uh, NSF, and of course, UIC that have um, believed <laughs> in these crazy ideas to study uh, opilionic behavior and have provided funding opportunities for me to do this. And lastly, um, I will not be in would have not been able to be here without the uh, tremendous support that all, many of my mentors and many of my colleagues have put in the past, ranging from my time at the University of Costa Rica, at Berkeley, UW Milwaukee, and people here um, at the UIC. So I'm very grateful. And science is something that we do together, we do in teams. And even though I'm here telling you this, this is work that has come thanks to the work of many, many people along the way. Um, and with that, I want to say thanks. I want to open up if you have any questions. Here's some, um, yeah, here's a QR code if you want to hear more about my research and whatnot. But with that, I'll be happy to take any questions for these next couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. This is Jocelyn speaking. Um, thank you for your presentation and sharing your research with us. Uh, we do have a couple questions, but I also want to invite the audience to add them to the chat or raise your hand under the reaction button so I may call on you to unmute your mic. Um, the first question that I have for you, um, we saw that the type of arachnid that you were talking about, they can't regenerate their legs, but are there examples of other arachnids that grow their parts or through evolution or survival? Yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, and actually growing their legs back is somehow the norm for arachnids for, and other arthropods while they're still developing, you know, because once uh, arthropods reach uh, maturity or adulthood, <laughs> um, they stop growing and they start uh, molting. So at that point, they will not be able to regrow their legs. However, if, for example, spiders, uh, cactus, bugs, uh, emipterans, dipterans, and so on. If they lose legs early on in their development, they're able to regrow them because they can grow them back. Uh, so a lot of the work that has been focused on autonomy on leg loss and tail loss comes from systems from uh, arthropods 
and reptiles that they grow their legs back. So the, the sort of like behavioral trajectory that I show functions very differently for animals that can grow their legs back. So opilionids are a little weird, <laughs> are an exception to that rule in the sense that they do not grow them back um, overall. Thank you. Um, another, I do see the chats. Um, and so one of the questions is out of curiosity and with a lot of respect for your research and because of interest in the social sciences, can you speak a little more about the ethical implications of working with spiders? In the social sciences, uh, we file projects for an IRB approval. Is that is there the same type of process in the biology? biological sciences? Um, yes, thank you, David, for the question. Certainly, there's a bunch of mechanisms in which we ensure that the work that we do has uh, limited implications on the natural population of these animals. Um, and for animal behavior research, there's like, you know, international protocols, professional societies that we are members of they they ask you they they ask us to be fully cognizant of that um long story short and um for invertebrate animals is not very well regulated for good or bad that that means that we have less uh, paperwork to do, less IRB equivalent. If you were working with, and I see a bad researcher here in the audience, and she can speak more <laughs> to that, but there's more work involved with that. So we have been paying less attention or institutions have been paying less attention to that, which is unfortunate because we want to make sure that we maintain the the, the welfare and, and the health of these animals. We internally take every precaution. As I mentioned, we monitor the, these animals, their behavior, their well-being, all the experimental procedures that I show here, what I'm doing is sort of like replicating a process that happens out there in the field. So all my research involves doing something that animals out there are experiencing um, in, in that respect. And, and yeah, there's a push to in, include more invertebrates in these sort of like protocols to make sure that we are complying. I mean, all of my work complies with Costa Rican government regulations for for handling animals and so on and and sometimes when we sort of like move animals from one place to another we want to make sure and sometimes it's like where are the what kind of permit permits do i need to apply and they're like yeah there are no permit procedures here because they're not you know uh honeybees are very well regulated and dangerous spiders are regulated but they with these animals sometimes i've had the the um situations in which government officials are like, what kind of animal is that? We don't care about that. <laughs> uh, I also have uh, multiple, multiple questions. I do see um, Rosa's questions, I'll get to them. Uh, but first, um, we wanted to know uh, from your perspective, what impact does climate change have on the tropical arachnids? As you started talking about some of the environmental pressures, um, how, how does that affect their food sources, their habitats, in relation to the ones that you mentioned with the mossy tree, the tree bark, and the fern, um, and also just their finding their habitats? Yes, that is a good one. Certainly, uh, land use change is a big one in tropical environments, particularly in Central America. Um, there's a, not a lot of forest left. Um, in Costa Rica, we we went through a big expansion of pasture um, in the 70s, which did not do very well with local ecosystems. So we don't fully understand and like uh, the implications. Uh, changes in in climatic patterns have consequences in the hydrology of this ecosystem, potentially having implications of, of on animal survival, but also, as you mentioned, in their food sources, how likely they are to find food and so on. This is sort of like we do not understand very well, and there, we need to do more research to sort of like, first of all, protect forests, and second, to understand what are the potential steps that we can do um, to, to sort of like start get into those questions yeah mm -hmm. and i i heard you mention uh previously right that they they have sort of a disregard for this type of spider but are there any uh 
conservation involvement, practices from the community members from the region in Costa Rica? That is a fantastic question. Is I'm sure there are, um, and that is one of the directions that my future fieldwork engagement is 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 moving toward towards um, understanding and and sort of like learning more from the communities what these animals mean, what is the knowledge that they have to get to know more of this. And broadly, I would say in this is not exclusive to Costa Rica, but certainly uh, Costa Rica has designed good examples for this, but like for forest protection, for community-led uh, conservation and, my, and bio monitoring initiatives, it's good that we start putting these, um, these animals on the map, not only because they're fantastic, but also because under, you know, the umbrella of big uh, fancy animals as jaguars and tapers, there's a lot of ecological and ecosystemic processes that we do not understand. And I mentioned these animals are omnivorous, so they have a if we if we want to put it in those terms, like they have a very uh, big impact on ecosystem health that we still do not know. Thank you for that. And going back to these cultural questions of thinking about spiders, I must admit I had a I had to step back. I do have um, a phobia to spiders, um, and this was definitely um, sort of like exposure therapy. Yeah. But right, as I'm sure I'm not the only one. And so the cultural question is like, why do you think that humans have this reaction to, to arachnids? Um, why do they get a bad rep? Or why are they misunderstood and deemed as scary or tied to Halloween? Yeah, these are fantastic questions. I wish I wish I had a better answer. Um, and I'm this is going to be super hand wavy. Uh, oh, the second part the first part there's some research saying that um we don't like them because they're too different from us because they don't have a face and we like mammals and we like red pandas because they're cute and they have a cute nose and 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 ears and eyes and like and maybe i yeah I, i've been wanting to explore these more thoroughly and from scholars that know about these but having similarities morphological similarities with these animals help us or having these similarities uh, because we don't look like spiders at all, um, we we find it difficult to sort of like understand or to relate to them. So I think that might be a component of that. Another thing that I think as an arthropod researcher, I think that um, this fear that we have been instilled to of, of any sort of like arthropod moving crawly creature is also based on sort of like an impetu of like sort of like alienating ourselves from a lot of the diversity of not knowing it or just saying no everything is dangerous or the, the not wanting to engage a lot and and this is all hand wavy and and hopefully along the years of anybody that knows more about this is listening let us know because i'll be super interesting to explore sort of like the cultural implications of why we like the creatures that we do. And in as researchers, we ask ourselves the questions, why are we interested in exploring research and understanding certain animals and not others? And as a side note, in animal behavior, there's a big, in a bunch of research, there's a big taxonomic bias on studying a few animals. So primates, there's a lot of research with primates in animal behavior, but certainly there's many more animals, primates and birds, are so, somehow 80% of animal behavior research or animal behavior papers are in those animals, but you know they are only a very small fraction of diversity and of, of on earth. And the more we study more animals, the more we understand nature as a whole. I agree. And I but I do have two follow-up questions to that. Um, do you think that um, is seen mostly from a Western world perspective and the construct of Christianity? And also, do you think that that may have an impact or an effect on, on the interest to study and protect them? That is a fantastic question. And I do not know. Coming from uh, 
a country where uh, Catholicism has a big influence in many aspects of it? <laughs> I would say yes, certainly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, certainly has a big role in what we think of nature and what we value in nature, uh, the cultural um, value that we attribute to animals and, and ecosystems and how we explore it. That said, there's also a lot of, um, yeah, no, I'm going to start right there because I, I don't really know. I'll be super interested and hopefully someone on campus, uh, if you know about this and you're there, <laughs> let us know because I'll be super interested um, to hear more about this. For sure. Thank you so much. I do want to be mindful of time. So thank you again, Ignacio, for sharing your research with us. Everybody, please use your emojis, your reaction buttons. Help, uh, help me thank our presenter. Uh, I'm sure if we had more time, we would go into your experiences um, and what it was like working with the community members and doing your research in Costa Rica. Um, but also, I'm sure that we can take away some of the lessons that that you've shown us from communication to the aggregation to adaptation and how we can incorporate that into our lives. Um, but that is all we have for you today. Thank you all for joining us for today's public program. To everyone in the space, uh, we hope that you can join us in the rest of the Earth Month programming. Tomorrow, April 20th, we will having uh, an Earth Artivism Fest. So it's an in interactive open art studio. So you're more than welcome to join us. We can put all the links in the chats to make sure you keep up with us and follow us on social media. Thank you again.